Today we'll look at two methods, MPEG and NFXP. My name is Battle Shanning and this is today's lecture on dynamic programming. So we have already covered the nested fixed point algorithm or NFXP. So Rust, John Rust, he applied this method to estimate uh, a model of replacement of bus engines already in 1987. We've just developed this algorithms for that purpose. Now we looked at that last time, so we already pretty much introduced to it the idea that when you try to estimate these structural models, you would try to maximize some likelihood functions imposing the constraints every time you evaluate the likelihood function because you solve the nested fixed point problem every time you do that. So there's another approach, and this is what we'll talk about today, where we use constraint optimization solvers to do the same thing. Here you would maximize the likelihood function again, but then subject to the constraints that the Bellman equations need to hold. Now the difference compared to the nest of fixed point approach is that these constraints does not have to hold at each iteration as you try to maximize the likelihood function or solve the constraint optimization problem. So Sue and Judd advocated for this in Econometrica 2012 in their paper and called this method the mathematical program with the equilibrium constraints. So there is a comment to that paper in, in Econometrica by, by John Rust, myself, and Fedor Ishakov. And uh, we're going to look at some of those results a little bit later in this, in this lecture. Now next time is, is more Harold Sucker, but on, on more involved models where we also introduce uh, equilibrium and we'll, we'll look particularly at durable good markets. And then after that, we'll go to the CCT type, CCP type of two-step estimators um, and nested super likelihood. So MPAC is actually used in quite a lot of contexts and can be used in, in, in many contexts because there's so many dif different nested fixed point problems. Now we've already looked at one, the bus engine replacement problem um, by, by uh, that, that formalizes this, uh, the decisions of this superintendent of maintenance, Harold Sucker, and how he replaces engines, thinking about how he can save cost in the future, maintenance cost and operating cost if he pays this replacement cost now. Okay, now we're gonna, we're gonna use this model again to, um, um, to, to, to illustrate the um, constraints optimization approach and try to see if we can estimate uh, the circular model using EPEC. But it has, and it can be used in, in other contexts too, like in, in random coefficients or logic demand models. It's also really a, a nested fixed point problem, okay? Where there's some equilibrium constraints that needs to hold when you try to maximize the likelihood function or whatever sample criterion you're using in the estimation. So Doopy, Fox, and Sue actually implemented um, BLP type of models using constraints optimization approach and um, found that, that there are some problems that are involved in estimating these models with NFXP if you're not really super careful about the tolerances in the NF fixed point. This can go, you know, in many places. So Dupe, Fox, and Sue really advocated for, for this constraints optimization approach as being uh, a solution to those problems. Okay, so they they show how some of those errors they can accumulate, and you can get really something that is that is not really super stable. Now um, we also will we will also look at how we estimate dynamic discrete discrete games, or you can use MPEG for that. Uh, this will not be in this lecture, but there's a really nice paper by by um, Sue or Chilin Sue on static games um, that we'll look at first, and then later we'll look at. Uh, another nice paper in, in QE, uh, uh, Quantitative Economics, at 2014, um, that that estimates a model, a dynamic game of um, competition between supermarkets uh, of, of a Gita Gibiria and Mira 2007. So they do that with MPEG 2. So, so this is a fairly general idea. Uh, essentially, you maximize some sample criterion uh, that you will use in an estimation, for instance, a likelihood function subject to some equilibrium constraints it needs to hold. So, I mean, this is really the idea of a nested fixed point problem and, and they're just using constraint optimization solvers to do that instead. Okay, so let's just remind ourselves of Harris-Circuit because we're gonna use this model to, to illustrate the MPEG approach here. 
So we have a binary choice set. If D is equal to zero, then you just do ordinary maintenance. There's no replacement. Or DT equal to one, then there's a replacement. Okay. Now the state variable here is is um, Myrickson's last replacement, and then there's these epsilon shocks that are ID extreme value distributed. Okay. The utility function is uh, basically uh, you play a replacement cost if you replace the engine and then you get a brand new engine. Uh, so you pay the operating cost of a brand new engine. If you keep it, you have to pay the, the, the operating and maintenance cost of a bus that has mileage X. Okay. Now, so this is the utility function. Then there is the epsilon, um, the epsilon shocks that shifts the utility uh, between the two alternatives, replace and not replace, our I extreme value. And then this state variable process is this re regenerative random walk, where if you replace the engine, then the bus state of the bus is just regenerated to its initial value, say x equal to zero or zero mile rich. So in order to estimate this model, and, and by the way, you know, Harris Sucker, he's forward looking. So he's maximizing, uh, he's choosing these actions in order to maximize the, uh, the future sum of discounted expected utilities or uh, so, um, or expected discounted utilities. Um, and, and, and so, um, so it's not only, it's not only this slide here, there's a dynamic programming problem too. Um, and, and the solution to that dynamic programming problem can be formalized by this last equation here if you impose all Rust's assumptions, which is additivity of the, um, of the uh, additivity in the utility function of the epsilons, and you have conditional independence and i to extreme value uh, terms, or uh, i to extreme valued um, unobserved state variables, epsilons. So there, there are no epsilons here. Now we talked about this last time, so this is in some sense it's just a reminder. Now the job here is really, we have some data on replacements D and X's and, and, and observed state variables X, and we have panel data in this so that we can observe uh, the transitions on, on, on X, okay? Um, the likelihood contributions here for, for a, a given bus is basically the sum of the log of the likelihoods uh, that originate from the conditional choice probabilities um, of the observed uh, choices, and then the uh, uh, trend lock of the transition uh, probabilities for, for the transi observed transitions of mileage, if you will. Okay. Now, the issue here for the nested fixed point algorithm, or, or, or to, in order to maximize this likelihood function, is that this guy here depends, uh, the, the, the choice probabilities, they, they depend on EV, or the expected value, um, and in order to get the expected value, well, you need to solve this uh, fixed point problem. So this is really, you know, the nested fixed point algorithm in a nutshell. It is the nested fixed point algorithm solves this unconstrained optimization problem here um, where, where you would uh, maximize the likelihood function um, and then realize here that the likelihood function that you have um, uh, here is really an implicit function of um, um, uh, the, we, that the, the expected value function is an implicit function of the structural parameters that you're estimating. Since every time you evaluate the likelihood function, you just recalculate and recalculate uh, uh, these, these uh, uh, expected values by finding the fixed points. So the solution is really a solution, a, 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 a implicit function of those parameters. Okay. So, so here, it's really key that, that the expected value function here only depends on uh, or the likelihood function only depends on the structural parameters, right? So there's no uh, other things we're maximizing with respect to. It's only the structural parameters. And then we're inside the likelihood function that's this expected value, which is an implicit function of the structural parameters, theta. So, so you've already seen the nested fixed point algorithm. There's an outer loop that search over the parameter space. And then for each evaluation of the likelihood function, well, then you need to go here and, and do the inner loop um, uh, and, and, and find the, the solution to this Bellman equation um, by a combination of successive approximations and, and newton kantorovich iterations. We're going to talk about newton kantorovich iteration just a little bit later. Uh, turns out to actually be quite, quite important to do that implementation. Now, um, so this is, this is really what you need to solve, like going back one slide. Okay. Um, okay. Now, let's move on to mathematical programming with equilibrium constraints. This is slightly different, 
Now, notice here, I mean, the, the problem looks similar, right? It's very similar, we're maximizing the same function, but now there's no, the, there's no um, subscript theta here, okay? I mean, that's what we have down here, right? It's, we have a subscript theta here to highlight that it's a implicit function of the structure parameters, right? But then we are maximizing now the likelihood function, not only with respect to the structural parameters, but also with respect to the expected value function. Now, so now we are maximizing a function with respect to a set of parameters and a function. Now we're gonna discretize the expected value. So uh, that means that EV or the, is really just a finite number of variables. So if we have n grid points, there's gonna be n variables due to EV. Okay, and then there is, say, there is uh, uh, like uh, five structural parameters in theta, and then there will be five parameters additional to max to, to in the constraints optimization problem. Okay, now the constraints is that the Bellman equation needs to hold. Okay, now see, the Bellman equation er, depends on both, the, or the constraints both depends on the, the parameters, right? Because they index how the Bellman operator looks. And then it also depends on the other variable that in the constraint optimization problem, EV, that we are maximizing the likelihood with respect to. So um, the idea is in order, in order to do this, so what Sue and Judd advocated for was to use, you know, state-of-the-art constraint optimization solvers such as Nitro um, to solve these problems. I mean, there's, there's professional software out there that can handle really, really big problems. Okay. okay, so in their paper, they consider two implementations. They consider one in, um, in, in a combination of, uh, in, um, in Ample, a high-level programming language uh, that passes, um, um, that passes the, 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 the Ample is a high-level programming language that formulates a problem um, where you can actually, it's, 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 it's really much like GAMS for those of you who, who knows about uh, that software to, that we used to solve general equilibrium models. But, but it's really a software that formulates the problem in a, in a high level way and then pass the mathematical problem to a solver, say for instance, Nitro or Conopt or, or other solvers for constraint optimization problem. One of the nice things about that implementation is that it has, um, automatic differentiation of Jacobians and Hessians, and then it automatically also in, utilizes the sparsity patterns of the Jacobians on, and the constraints. Now, I'm gonna go in more, much more into details about this later, but, but for now, the Jacobian of the constraints, that's really the derivative of this guy with respect to the variables, right? So there's two sets of variables, so you have n grid points, um, and and you need and 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 five and five parameters. Then you have five plus n variables, and then you differentiate this guy with respect to all these variables. Okay, this gives a a a, 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 a matrix because this is a vector mapping. Okay, so this is this Jacobian. Okay, and the 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 Hessian and all in the Hessian here. I'm talking about the Hessian of the likelihood function with respect uh, differentiating twice with respect to um, uh, both the structural parameters theta and the um, expected value functions. Um, so this is a this is actually a much bigger uh, hessian that you would have in the unconstrained optimization problem. Um, turns out that these two matrices are really sparse, and it's key to implement that. So we're going to look a little bit in detail about that now. Now they also consider another implementation um, where the use uh, Chico, where where the user in in MATLAB where the user would need to supply uh, Jacobians, Hessians, and sparsity patterns, and and uh, and 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 also the second order derivatives. You can, in principle, code that, but it's really really messy. Um, so this puts a lot of work on you if you want to do it in MATLAB um, or in Python, um, because coding all these uh, the derivatives um, is a little bit error prone. So this is really like a a huge benefit of Ample. It just does automatic differentiation for you and just, you know, you formulate the problem and pass it to the solver. So you don't have to think about how to code all that. And, um, 
and and that's really so. Yeah, so, so this is actually um, the 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 ampoule is supposed to be much faster because it has the second order derivatives and automatic differentiation, and it, and it is okay. So anyway, this is uh this is kind of the overview. So in order to formulate uh, this impact problem or mathematical program with equilibrium constraints, MPEX solves a. Um, you, you need to you need to uh, specify a bunch of components. Okay, so so um, the objective function to be minimized. Well, that's uh, um, I, we know, we, sometimes we're going to turn the the <clears throat> we're going to turn the the uh, maximum likelihood problem into a m minimum negative likelihood problem. So we, we because you know we have minimization routines. So we're going to minimize the negative of the likelihood function. Okay. Um, so the variables here, what, what are those? You have to specify what the variables are. The variables, they are theta and EV. And here, um, for, for the, uh, the, you know, for the implementation where you've estimated the transition probabilities in a first step and you only consider a two-step approach, well, then you would have only two parameters, the replacement cost, and then some parameter C that indexes the utility or the, the cost function in, in the engine replacement problem. So these are like uh, basically parameters that enter into the utility function. Okay. You could also have more parameters inside theta. And then you have, uh, we've discretized EV into endpoints. So, so the set of variables is going to be EV1 all the way up to to EVN. So for instance, if you're 175 grid points, then in this case, you would have 177 uh, variables in the constraint optimization approach. Now you can see here, already here, that if you have, uh, this is a simple problem with only one continuous state variable, but if you have like two uh, continuous state variables that were discretized into 100 points, well, then this vector would be a 10,000 long vector, okay? So you have like 10,000 variables plus two structural parameters that you would have to you know, vary in order to maximize the likelihood function and then impose the constraints. So now we have many more, many, many more variables in the problem and fewer, um, but, but we don't have to solve the fixed point problem. Okay, so many more variables. Okay? It's kind of increase the dimension. Now you can sometimes, if you have some prior knowledge on uh, on, on, on the variables here, on the, on, on the, the structural parameters, you can put some bounds on them and pass that to the solver, which is a good idea because you don't want to search everywhere. And sometimes, you know, if you have a probability uh, that should be between zero and one, then, you know, maybe the likelihood function that takes that probability uh, can really, you know, screw up because you take the log of a probability and then it's suddenly negative, you know, you don't want to get that. So you want to put bounds on these parameters to, to say, you know, probability is between zero and one. And here in this case, RC, you know, we say we're willing to take a risk and say RC is, is, is positive and it's less than infinity. So, you know, but the solver is going to tell you if you're on the bounds. So if you're, if you're bouncing the bounds, if you will, then you would have to increase the amount. So, so here you could, for instance, say the value function is smaller than 5,000, which is a little bit arbitrary, right? You have need to know, know about the problem. You can increase the bounds if you, if it turns out that it's, um, that, that, that the bound is higher because the solver is going to tell you. Now, a fourth component is for successful implementation. I mean, sometimes you can actually just, you know, supply this problem, then the, 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 the solver with somewhere inside calculate gradients and hessians. But in MATLAB, that would be uh, done numerically, which is terrible because, you know, just think of the Hessian here. The Hessian is now, um, you know, n plus the number of parameters times n plus the number of parameters. Uh, so it's a big matrix. If you have 10,000, um, uh, if, if you have two state variables discretized on 100 points, well, you have something that's on the order of 10,000 by 10,000, okay? So, um, these are extremely costly to compute, especially numerically, because then you would have to perturb the likelihood function so many times, okay? So uh, therefore, calculating these things analytically or having software calculating the, them analytically is key. Okay, it turns out that this Hessian is really a sparse matrix. We'll go into details with that. The constraints, well, the constraints is the Bellman equation must hold, okay? So we can formulate it in terms of uh, um, you know, the right hand, subtracting the left and the right hand side of the Bellman equation, like here, you know, just subtract this to the left side and you set that has put, put equal to zero. So we define this, ver this uh, new operator F, 
um, that that um, it must be equal to zero. So this is the way uh, constraints optimization solve. But usually, once a constraint, you know, you specify a function, a nonlinear function that should be equal to zero when the constraints are satisfied. Okay, so so this is the way we can do this. Now, in order to solve constraint optimization problems, well, you know, you have you have tried to do constraint optimization problems. There, we usually use some basic version of Newton's. Uh, algorithm or New Newton Rapson where you need to supply gradients and maybe second order derivatives. Okay. Now this is the same here. Okay, so we need to supply that for the objective function. But we also need to impose or uh, need to uh, include uh, first order derivatives of the constraints. And these are the partial order derivatives of the of uh, of the Bellman operator with respect to both the expected values and the structural parameters. And remember, this one depends on both, right? You know, the utility function here, let, let's just go back and see how it depends on it, right? I mean, the Bowman operator here, you can clearly see the parameters just indexing uh, utilities on the right-hand side here. So it's clearly a part of that operator. It's also, if you want to estimate parameters and indexes the uh, transition density, well, it's also on the right-hand side here. So it's definitely indexing the parameters. And then also it's inside EV here because the expected value function is, uh, is a function of the parameters. But now we can look at only partial derivatives when we calculate these derivatives. So when we're calculating derivatives with respect to E to to, uh, to to theta, we're not going to differentiate EV. We're just going to keep that fixed. Okay. Um, well, you can also differentiate this guy with respect to EV, and th this is what you can really, uh, you know, you can see it's appearing on the right-hand side. So it's beta times something, okay? And we're going to derive it in just a little bit. <clears throat> okay, so these are the Jacobians of the constraints. So the, this, the, the Bellman equation or the Bellman operator can clearly be differentiated. Right? Just think about when you implemented this in Python or MATLAB, right? Yeah, there's a function, okay? You just, uh, you just see what happens when you change various elements to that function just a little bit. Like, you know, change EV just a little bit, well, then you get another uh, guess on the expected value function now, okay? Just, just like the equation would say. And then a, a key thing here is the sparsity patterns for the constraint. Jacobian of uh, the constraints and the Hessians and 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 so so this is a little bit you know plan for the, for for the next few slides and uh, we're gonna go through you know most of them one by one I think the bounds doesn't deserve a lot of comments so we're not gonna talk about that okay so let's start taking a look at the objective function now a key difference to when you're doing the nested fixed point algorithm is that the objective function here can be evaluated directly in closed form okay. So uh, the likelihood function has the same structure. It's you know the sample sum of, of the log of the probabilities of, uh, of of the probabilities evaluated at the data, and and for the transition uh, densities too. Okay, so this is the same thing. Okay, now the key difference here is that we take EV the expected value as an input as a variable. It's not something that we are solving for as a function of theta, right? We don't need to solve any fixed point problems. Here, we just put EV into the likelihood function and evaluate it at the data. Same thing with the uh, with the structural parameters, theta one, okay? So, so this is a really just a, like a few lines of, 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 you know, Python code or MATLAB code or whatever code you're writing. Um, and you don't need to, 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 to write up um, a fixed point uh, solvers or anything just to implement the likelihood function. Okay. So the, the constraints, of course, have to hold when you maximize the likelihood function, but but only at the end, not at e each iteration. Every time the solver is searching for the optimal, and also when we calculate the derivatives of this guy, which is the next thing, the derivatives or the first and second order derivatives or the gradients and, and the Hessian, we are taking we're talking about the partial derivatives. So when I'm th changing theta, I'm holding fixed EV. Okay. So we're talking about partial derivatives. Okay. Now um, the the gradient here takes the form of a uh, you know dim theta plus n vector. Okay, so if you have if you have like two structural parameters R C uh, and C, and then you have like five uh, transition probability parameters, then you would have like uh, two plus five that's seven structural parameters, and then there would be 
n grid points because EV is in, discretized into n different grid points. So in that case, you would have uh, 182 parameters or variables okay, that you have to differentiate this objective function with respect to. Now, this vector of gradients has this block diagonal structure. And here I've just ignored uh, theta 2, which is indexing the, the transition densities. But you know, you can go calculate that too. Okay. So, so the first part here, well, that is essentially just taking the, 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 the function we had on the previous slide here, differentiating with respect to theta 1. And then there's some structure about uh, 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 derivatives of uh, log or, or uh, likelihood functions for discrete choice problems that makes it look like this. Okay, so um, oh sorry. Um, so what is this? This is the, this is essentially the probability um, evaluated uh, for for alternative d evaluated at the data, and here. I take D as an indicator for replacement, okay? So for simplicity here, okay? Um, so D is equal to one, uh, and if you replace an equal to zero otherwise, okay? So this is a dummy for replacement, okay? And so this is really like the residuals for the model, right? Because this is a probability um, that, um, <clears throat> that the probability of replacement minus the actual replacement, okay? Now that has to be uncorrelated with, um, with utility differences um, from keeping and replacing, okay? Now, we you different the derivatives of that, well, if you have a static logit model with a linear, con linear utility function, that would just be your x, and then you have, like, you know, residuals being uncorrelated with explanatory variables. So this is, a, you know, what this is, is really, it's the, it's the um, derivatives of the likelihood function of a static logit model, okay? So the key thing here is, of course, when you're doing that differentiation, you're not taking into account, I mean, notice here it says utilities, it doesn't say choice specific values, right? Because um, if you look at what we're differentiating here, I'm only taking the derivative from this part here. I'm, I'm totally ignoring this because EV, well, I'm talking about partial derivatives. So um, EV here is, is, is being hold fixed as opposed to the case where you have uh, the next fixed point algorithm where you would have to take into account this is an implicit function. So, so this is all zero, okay? It's very easy to differentiate this thing, okay? Um, and, and if you move on to the next set, well, let's, let's start with EV um, for other elements than first one, okay? I'm taking that or first one out special because it appears in both, uh, in, 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 it, 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 it appears in all elements, right? Because, uh, you know, you always have the option. You can see that directly here, right? If you replace, right? If you replace, well, then you would get EV zero, right? The first element of that, of that matrix, okay? That's exactly equal to that. So, so that's why you, when you differentiate with respect to that, it's appearing both in the, in the uh, numerator and the uh, numerator and the, and the denominator, okay? So, but the other ones, well, you know, you can, I think, you, you know, this is essentially just an ap application of, of high school math to get from, from, here, or from, from here to here, differentiating this function here with respect to EV holding theta one fixed. So um, that's, that's, that should be doable. I'm going to skip the Hessian. I mean, uh, the Hessian will take several slides, and the bottom line is it's pretty complicated to compute. I mean, or tedious to compute. I mean, it, it, you, it, same same rules applies. It's high school math, a little bit, you know, uh, application of the chain rule, and uh, you know, differentiating uh, exponential unlocks and so on. Then then you get there, right? But um, uh, I'm not going to write it up. One thing I want to note here is if you look at the first order derivatives, I mean, differentiating these guys here with respect to EV um, uh, 2 up to n um, is, is really just going to be a diagonal matrix for most of the part. Because the Hessian, and this makes it, the Hessian really clearly sparse, uh, it's also symmetric, but it's clearly sparse since the derivatives uh, with respect um, to to EV only depends on on the expected value of this in the same point. Okay, I mean you can see that really here, right? Because um, it is it is simply uh, there's a dummy variable in here for for the observation being 
uh, for that particular point. So um, any other points is going to be ruled out. It's just going to be dummied out uh, if, if uh, that, that that observation doesn't correspond to it. So so I mean you can sit down and you know do the math, but you will discover that 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 makes it it uh, incredibly sparse. Okay, so the the this. Implementing these sparsity patterns is, of course, clearly um, something that you want to do um, when you calculate those sessions, right? I mean, one thing is the storage, but the other thing is the comp computation because we talked about, we, you know, we're talking about a model with, you know, uh, seven variable, uh, seven parameters and, and 175, um, um, uh, 175 uh, grid points. But you know, suppose you had like a you know again ten ten thousand grid points, right? Then it would be nice if the if, if the part that this part of the um, Hessian which I'm uh, showing here is really just a, a diagonal matrix, okay? Uh, because then this all this wide area would just be all zeros. Okay, I'm gonna come back to to these uh, sparsity patterns in just a minute. Okay, so that was all about gradients and Hessians, and and it's it's while tedious, you know, it's a good mental exercise to do some derivatives once in a while, and and you can do it. Okay, now <clears throat> now moving on, before we move on to talk about the um, Jacobian of the constraints, I want to remind you just a little bit about the discretization of the model. We discretize the mileage into to to n bends. Okay, so so. Um, so uh, this means that you know x uh, mileage goes from from x one up to x n, and um, and the first element is zero. And and with that we can write the the, the uh, expected value function uh, in a simple uh, simpler way, which is the sum. Okay. Now you can see when you differentiate this guy here, it's a sum over only j elements. Okay. And the, and 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 so you want to take advantage of that somehow when you calculate derivatives. Of that, because we're gonna calculate the derivatives of the Bellman operator when calculating the Jacobian of the constraints. Okay, so that simplicity you really want to take into account. Well, you can also write it in, in matrix form like this. Okay, so essentially now uh, the the expected value function here is um, is some transition matrix, uh, the the transition matrix um, uh, times times a lock times a lock sum. Okay. Um, and and uh, you can write it up for 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 both decisions, both uh, replace and not replace. But then you realize that that really the the value of replacing is the same as the value of not replacing f when you have a brand new bus. Okay, so so that's why we just organize the whole thing in one vector. We call it EV. Okay, so you can stack. I mean, here it's it's really just everything. Uh, that does not depend on x now is just stacked all over the different values of my reach. So x is not one up to to n. Yeah, okay. Same thing with utilities. And yet there's going to be another vector with choice probabilism that would just p of p of d, which would be like the vector of all the choice probabilities. Okay. So so you can write this in in matrix form in, in, instead, and this makes it easy to uh, you know implement in MATLAB, which is very good with uh, you know matrix algebra and so on. Okay. You can also do that in Python. Okay, so now you want to differentiate this guy, right? Or you want to differentiate the Jacobian of the constraints, and 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 see the Jacobian of the constraints. Well, that that's that's a matrix, right? Uh, because the Bellman equation itself imposes n constraints. There's a constraint for 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 each of the expected value functions, right? I mean, this is a this is a vector, right? So the n vectors is as n constraints. And now we have um, we have n plus the number of uh, structural parameters as um, uh, plus a number of parameters as variables. Okay, so this Jacobian takes the form of an n by dimension of theta, and this should be plus. Sorry about that. Uh, plus n uh, matrix. So if you have uh, uh, like seven parameters and 175 grid points. Well, then you would have 100, 182 columns in that matrix. Okay, and it would look something like this. Okay, this is this is a coping of the constraint, the one we are trying to calculate. Okay, I'll get back to that in a second. Okay, now the the, the Jacobian of the constraints. Well, that's the derivatives of of the of, of the of the constraints or the derivatives of uh, EV um, minus uh, the Bellman operator. Now the first um, 
columns, okay? The first columns in, in this matrix that you combine in the constraints, the first seven columns, if you have seven parameters here, well, this is corresponding to the derivatives, the derivatives of the, uh, of, of, with respect to the structural parameters, okay? Now, for instance, for theta one, we would get a, you know, a n by a dim matrix with n uh, rows and, uh, um, and, and uh, you know, the dimension of theta one columns uh, that looks something like this, okay? So, so this is what it is. It's really just the, um, the, the transition probability for keeping times, um, uh, and this is here, there should be a matrix, a, a matrix product, and this is a, this is a vector product or, or, or do, uh, element by element product. Um, and, and, and here you have the, the choice probability multiplied with the utility differences from keeping and replacing. Okay, so, so this, is, this is, you know, what you get out of differentiating this formula here with respect to theta one. And theta one is inside a utility function here. And you can do the math again, okay? So it looks similar to what we had before. And you can see this is uh, not depending on theta. So this is just something we multiply. And then essentially you just have to, to differentiate the log sum with respect to, to, uh, to this, uh, these utilities. And then the log sum differentiated, well, that's, the, uh, that's actually equal to the choice probabilities. And then you need the inner derivative, which is the utility differences since this part here is whole fixed and you're not differentiating, uh, um, uh, taking into account that this is an implicit function. So, so this is the derivative of the inner uh, derivative of this part here is it's just e equal to zero. So you're left with this. Okay, now you can do the math uh, for, uh, for, the, the, for the CCPs as well. So then you would differentiate this part here and essentially hold this part fixed, okay? So, um, <clears throat> but for EV, it's, uh, what it is that we need to compute here is the n by n matrix of derivatives of the, um, <clears throat> of the, of, with respect to EV, okay? Now, now the first part here is easy to differentiate. So that's just the indicator, uh, the, the um, that's, that's just the identity matrix, or if this was in, in functional space, it would be the identity operator, okay? So, um, and, and here we need to subtract the derivative, the Frechet derivative of the Bellman operator. And, you know, this sounds a little bit, you know, nasty, but, but really it is just go back to this equation and then just differentiate with respect to EV. And we can derive it later, uh, show it later, um, and you're going to work with it in, in the problem sets, but what you, what you can immediately see is that this is really just beta, beta, we have here times the uh, 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 transition matrix times something with choice probabilities, okay? Because, you know, the derivative with respect to this part here, well, that is just a choice probability. So it's choice probability way to sum of derivatives, okay? Because, uh, yeah, okay, so, so that, that, that can be, uh, that can be uh, uh, computed as, as well, okay? So this is, uh, um, um, yeah. Okay. Now I want to talk about a few words more about about the sparsity patterns. Okay, I mean this is a, for MPEG. It's a key factor to inf efficient implementation. Uh, I know. Um, <clears throat> I mean, there's two aspects of this. One is the storage of all these numbers, right? I mean, we have a small matrix here, but if you get many state variables, this is going to be huge. Okay. Um, so just alone, the storage of all these matrices is was one thing, but then there's also the multiplication when you when you're doing the uh, inside the algorithm that use, use that, that that maximizes or uh, that solves the constraints optimization problem. The Jacobian constraints are 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 uh, multiplied to. Uh, um, to 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 uh, uh, other uh, other vectors in there and and you know so so there's a lot of multiplication going on with this big matrix okay and you need to essentially invert a matrix that consists of these matrices here and also the the Hessian here um, has a lot of sparsity so that's one thing is the storage and the amount of computation where you would not need to use all those elements so software that takes that sparsity into account is going to save a lot of time another thing is just the very fact that you know that this is zero makes, uh, makes it unnecessary to even start computing them, okay? 
So if you can somehow tell the solver about what those sparsity patterns are, well, then you can save a lot of computer time. Okay, so now here's the example with where, the, where there's two parameters in the utility function. There's five parameters in the, uh, uh, in the transition uh, probability matrix, and that gives seven parameters, and then you have 175 parameters. So this, this is corresponding to uh, these first columns here. So then you have uh, 175 plus seven, that's 182, um, uh, columns, columns in this matrix. Okay, now there's 175 uh, rows. Okay, so this would give something around this part here would give something around um, uh, 14, uh, 1400 uh, uh, non-zero elements, and the, the other part here is coming from the um, um, from where the transition matrix is really essentially non-zero. Okay, and that's, a, that's about 800 elements. So if you add it up, it's going to be 2,264 elements. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to comment on, the, on more in, on the hash, and we already know why we only have this these part of the epidemiacle. Uh, we talked about that previously. Okay, so, so you can see here, this is really just mimicking the, uh, the derivatives um, because the Jacobian of the constraint, the last part here, is really equal to the derivatives of the uh, constraints um, of the Bellman operator differentiated with respect uh, to EV, okay? And that is what we learned was equal to the discount factor times the transition matrix, okay? Weighted with choice probabilities, okay? So it's like a choice probability uh, weighted uh, transition matrix, okay? And here is the transition matrix. We know it's sparse, and we talked about it last time. Uh, you know, th this is uh, this is a transition matrix for my rich, and you know, bus doesn't drive uh, drive 400, 450 thousand kilometers in one month, and it doesn't drive backwards. So there's a lot of zeros here, okay? And this is if you keep the engine. This this is if you replace it out here, you're going to have lots of zeros. So if you look at those, those the sparsity pattern, uh, the transition matrix. The, the transition matrix is really um, uh, as sparse and 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 so the Frechet derivative or the derivative of the Bellman operator is really a choice probability weighted sum of those two matrices that has a bunch of zeros everywhere. Okay, so this is why when you combine all these non-zero elements here and weight that with choice probability of replacement, uh, it, then you get something here that is non-zero, and then you have all these diagonal elements when you when, when you're keeping the engine multiple, uh, weighted with a probability of replacement. And then you get something like what we had uh, to begin with. So this is really why you have this first band here, and then the diagonal band here. It's like a choice probability weighted sum of transition probabilities times beta, okay, or the derivative of the Bellman operator. Okay, so let's, uh, that's not enough about differentiation, but you know, knowing about the structure of the problem is actually quite important when you try to implement this in the computer because computers is our, still our scarce resource. It takes time to solve these models and you want to, you, you know, we want to push the frontier and solve, you know, bigger and more interesting models. So in order to do that, well, you need to use your computer power wisely. Okay. So let's let's make an example. So I'm going to go through the example that was in Sue and Judd's econometric uh, paper, 2002, where they made a horse race between the nested fixed point algorithm and uh, MPEG. Okay, so they simulated some data, and then you, you, they used doing Monte Carlo to to uh, as a test bed uh, for for those two estimators. Um, so uh, we we consider here uh, the the current the following experimental design. So there's 175 grid points. Uh, corresponding to I think it's table ten in in uh, in Rust nine eighty seven, um, and then the structural parameters uh, from there too. Okay, so these are uh, are the parameters from from table ten or uh, table. Yeah, I think it's table ten. Um, the cost function is linear, so this is also uh, the same functional form. Okay, Myers transition stay or move up with a uh, with 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 J J grid points. So this gives like. Uh, uh, four, actually four different uh, transition probability parameters in this case here. Okay, and then two uh, uh, st structural parameters, theta one and, and RC that we're trying to estimate. Okay, and then um, 
they solve for the expected value at these parameters and then generate uh, 250 data sets of monthly mileage data for 10 years and 50 buses. So this is like 500 observations. Okay, so they are trying to mimic the same situation as in REST 987, um, and but but then instead of estimating of those data, simulating uh, simulating data from the model. Okay, to evaluate the parameters. Now they do that actually for various different values of the discount factor and they do they do it for um, for various different um, estimations estimation procedures the impact procedure with implemented in this high level programming language called ample um, that's the first implementation now the benefit of that implementation as we touched upon earlier is that here you have second order derivatives of the um, the, the second order derivatives of the Hessians are implemented analytically. Okay, so there's automatic differentiation there. Okay, so this means that, that this matrix here, there's a functional, there's a uh, analytical calculation of this matrix here. Okay, um, and <clears throat> that's done all done in in ample. Okay, and then in amp, in in impact, well, that's uh, the version where you have to use to supply everything. So you, you know, here you use then using a, a routine called Nitro. You can call from MATLAB, but it's very similar to to fmincon or to the built-in optimizer that you would have in, in Python. Uh, say um, uh, optimize, minimize in scripty. Um, so um, here, what you, what you typically need, need to uh, supply yourself is these is all these elements that we've just been through. The you know what are the what are the constraints? What are the, uh, the the Jacobian of the constraints? What are the the gradients and and the Hessians and bounds and so on? Okay, uh, and doing that, implementing that can take a lot of time. Now, okay, so but but the bottom line is this is using second order derivatives. This is not. And this is NFXP. Okay, now NFXP. I'm going to go more into details, uh, but 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 uh, what it's doing is for every evaluation of the likelihood function, it's solving the fixed point problem. Now, what are they counting here? Okay, now let's start with the first one. This is the number of runs converged. This is the CPU time, and this is uh, the number of major iterations. So when you you're maximizing a, a, a function, well, you're taking a, a, some uh, s some some iterations. And this is counting how, how many of those iterations you uh, are, are taking, okay? And, um, and one iteration typically involves uh, computing first and second order derivatives and, um, and you know, putting them into a Newton type uh, formula, okay? Uh, that updates the sets of parameters by multiplying uh, the inverse of, of, of some boarded Hessian to, um, 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 to to um, uh, yeah yeah to to the gradients yes of course yes okay so <clears throat> anyway um, you know all about Newton and and so on otherwise you read documentation um, so this is number of major iterations and and um, and and this is number of function evaluations in this say, case the the likelihood function okay and and for the nested fixed point algorithm, they also calculate how many uh, contraction iterations you're taking to estimate the model on average for each data set. And look at this. I mean, the, you, you, the first thing you look at is the computer time here. Now, this is in seconds on a Mac, Mac Pro. Uh, I mean, it's an old Mac Pro, but it's 24 seconds, okay? Whereas M, 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 MPEG Ample is 0 0.13 seconds. Okay, so this sounds like it's a really a big advantage of, of this method. Okay, uh, uh, MPEG MATLAB is is surely slower because now you are not relying on those second order derivatives, but it's still faster than NFXP. Okay, and look at what is going on as you increase beta. Okay, now beta as this goes to one, the stability of um, um, of, of this uh, NFXP or the speed of NFXP surely drops a lot, right? I mean, 200, uh, uh, about, uh, 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 close to two minutes just to solve the engine replacement problem with beta equal to 0 0.995. But wait a minute. In 1987, John Rust was able to solve and estimate the engine replacement model with beta equal to 0 0.999. So what's going on here? And it's also saying here the 748 
thousand contraction iterations in order to estimate this model. So the, the issue here is, you know, you may want to ask, is, is NFXP really a dinosaur method? Is it it's totally inferior to the uh, to to MPAC? Or is something wrong with this tablet? And and it the, the, the Let's let's try to see if that's the case. I mean, we could do a bunch of things to try to um, uh, to, to speed up NFXP, and certainly doing seven hundred forty-eight thousand contraction iterations to estimate that model. I don't have patience for that. So let's see what we can do. Okay, so here's the NFXP survival kit. The first thing is really read the NF original NFXP manual uh, from nineteen hundred eighty-seven, which is also online in the course. Okay, and print out the pocket guide. Okay, so this is the first thing. Okay, there's a nice overview of what to do with the nested fixed point algorithm that, that, that illustrates many of, the, many of the bells and whistles on how to efficiently implement the nested fixed point algorithm. Some of them I'm going to go through in steps here. So, you know, you need to solve for the fixed point using Newton iterations or Newton Kantorovich iterations. I, I've alluded to that before, but that's not done in the Sue and Jet paper. Okay, this is why they're doing all these successive approximations over and over again. You need to recenter the Bellman equation to avoid problems with overflow and underflow when you're taking exponentials of uh, in the log sum of high values because when beta goes really close to one, well then the expected value increase, and when you take the expect uh, when you take the exponential of the expected value, well then that's that's uh, just going through the roof. Provide analytical gradients of the Bellman operator, that's essential to implement. And then to do the Newton control iterations, provide analytical gradients of the likelihood, and then use the B triple H or algorithm that, that is really a Newton type algorithm, but, but utilizes the fact that this is maximum likelihood. So we can approximate the Hessian with the outer product of the gradients, which is uh, which effectively means that you can replace calculating second order derivatives with calculating a matrix product. Okay, so here's some uh, some references. Okay, the, the first thing is you know read the documentation of, of the software you're doing or the method you're trying to implement, uh, and this uh, uh, this is this is available online. Okay, and there's a comment where we find that that results are a little bit different to the Sue and Jeff paper. Okay, so here's the nested fixed point algorithm. Okay, so this is from the do documentation manual actually cited. Okay, so formally one can view the nested fixed point algorithm as solving the following constraint optimization problem. Oh man, this looks like MPEG. Okay, so the idea is MPEG is actually uh, new. This is from from the version in 2002, but this is uh, date backs to to the 80s actually. So what was new in Su and Jid was actually doing it. Um, um, and implementing it in, in, in state-of-the-art constraint optimization solvers. Well, um, and then uh, he writes that since the contraction mapping always had a unique fixed point, it implies that the fixed point is an implicit function of theta. Well, you know all this now, but 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 really, uh, the, this means that the constraint optimization problem here can be form formulated as unconstrained optimization problem, and this is the uh, really the backbone of the nested fixed point algorithm. So this it's all in the manual and also at MPEG. Okay. So here's the pocket guide. And, and if you print it on A4, it's actually pretty nice. You can you know, fold it a couple of times and you, it fits into your jeans. You can have it with you everywhere. And this is uh, this is providing actually a pretty good overview of what is going on. So you start here with starting values, okay? This is your current, then the starting values were going to be your current set of estimates. And then for, for, from there, you go in and solve the model, okay, for a given set of the parameters, okay. This is, you initialize, you need to initialize the expected value function in order to do the contraction iterations, right. So you do that first, then you do some successive approximations on the Bellman equation or value function iterations, if you will, and then um, if, if that is sufficiently close to the expected value function, well, then you, uh, you, you move on and calculate the derivatives. Uh, otherwise, you just move back in this circle here and do successive approximations. Okay? And then once you calculate it, if it's close, and I'm going to talk about what's meant by close a little bit later, then you move on and calculate the Gato uh, derivative or the derivative of the Bellman operator. I think I mentioned it as a Frechet derivative, but that's in, in functional space. So you know the derivative of the Bellman operator, which is the Jacobian a part of the Jacobian the constraints for impact that you have to calculate there, um, and do the Newton uh, Kantorovich iteration. Okay, 
Now, I'm going to show you that uh, newton kotorovich iteration on slides. It's hard to read, but, but this is what you do. So first you do con uh, contraction iterations or, uh, or the value function iteration. And then after some time, you switch to newton kotorovich iterations. From there, when, once that's converged, well, you can calculate the derivatives of the likelihood function. Turns out the derivative of the likelihood function is really, uh, well, that depends on the derivative of the, the uh, the fixed point, which in turn, the, by the implicit function theorem, depends on the uh, derivative of the um, <clears throat> of, of the Bellman operator. So, so here, it's really when you calculate the derivatives of the likelihood function, it's coming out as a byproduct of the um, um, it's it's coming out as a byproduct from the solution algorithm. So you pretty much calculated the hardest part once you start calculating the derivatives of the Bellman operator with respect uh, of the of the likelihood function with respect to the uh, parameters. Okay. So now once you have the derivatives, well then you can go and calculate your Newton step. Okay. And then that that's when you start moving into the outer hill climbing algorithm because from there you have your derivatives and and uh, of the likelihood function and from the derivatives. Since we're using the outer product of the gradients, we can calculate an Hessian approximation and make a Newton step. Okay, and that gives a new guess of the structural parameters. Once you have that, you move right back, and then you resolve the model, calculate the solution by successive approximation and Newton contorted iterations, and then derivatives, and then you make a Newton step, and then you go. Okay, so let's you know go into details with equations and so on from here. Okay, so Newton control of iteration. This is a key thing that that Sue and Jet did not implement, and it's also you know it's also called policy iterations essentially. So uh, why we want to do that? I mean, this the problem we want to solve here is finding the fixed point um, of the contraction mapping. Okay, so 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 finding the fixed point of this one. Okay. Um, now, if you do successive approximation, uh, you would see that you have uh, you have linear convergence. Um, uh, you see here, it, it depends linearly on the error, okay? Um, and, and, but this means it's, this, this speed of convergence is, is, uh, um, uh, proportional to one minus beta. So, so, uh, as beta is very close to one, then it really slows down, okay? And, and you can see that once you start doing successive approximations and circuits problem with 0 0.999, nothing is happening for like decades of iterations, okay? Maybe not decades, but you know, many iterations. Um, the newton kotorovich iteration, well, well then <clears throat> um, the newton kotorovich iteration has the advantage that it is uh, quadratic convergence. So this means as you get closer and closer and closer to the solution, the uh, error is going to uh, decrease quadratically. Okay, so this means it's going to be first at the error is at the order of 10 to the power of minus 2, it's going to be 10 to the power of minus 4, and 10 to the power of minus 8, and so on. Okay, so this is quadratic convergence. Okay, um, so you really want to use that once you're close to the solution. Okay, the, pro is the, the good thing is that this is uh, globally convergence, the successive approximation because of the contraction mapping property of the Bellman operator. This is not necessarily globally convergence, but you can get into a domain of attraction by first using successive approximations, and then after a few iterations, newton kotorovich is going to be very, very uh, um, fast. Okay, so here is uh, the newton kotorovich iteration. So really, the, the problem is uh, convert the problem of finding a fixed point into the problem of finding, you know, the roots of a set of nonlinear equations. And here, f is really the same as the, as the constraints we're imposing on the MPEG um, uh, constraint optimization problem. Okay, you know it's the same. It's essentially the same set of constraints that you need to to satisfy, right? So we just need to put that equal to zero. And you can, and, and it's really simple. You just use Newton's method. Okay. So Newton's method. What is that? Is your current set of the variables you're solving for in this set E V, and then time the derivative of the set of equations you're solving for. So this is the derivative, which is uh, the identity operator minus the, the derivative of that operator, right? Um, uh, inverse, so the derivative inverse times, uh, the, times the function, okay? So this is Newton's method, okay? So <clears throat> this means we need to calculate this, this guy here, okay? 
Um, but but we already kind of covered that with MPEG a little bit. It's like beta times the uh, transition matrix uh, weighted with choice probabilities. And, and, uh, yeah. So so that's fairly simple to compute actually. Yeah. So you do the fixed point algorithm uh, um, uh, just as outlined uh, in in the in the pocket guide as a combination of successive approximations until the expected value comes into a domain of attraction, and then you switch to this algorithm. Okay. Now this is a more expensive algorithm to calculate because this is this matrix here is a n by n matrix. Okay, and you need to um, you need to invert it. Okay, and then you need to multiply it uh, with with a vector of new sets of expected values. Okay, so this is like what's coming out of doing a, 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 the it's the error you, you get out of doing a contraction iteration. Okay, so. <clears throat> So this is n by one, right? So you n by n by n times n by one, and this need to need to both store and so on. So here, here you can actually also really take advantage of sparsity because, uh, but because this matrix is really sparse, so, so yeah, it makes it it's easier to compute and so on. So um, yeah, anyway, so that's Newton control iteration. What's the result of this? Well, you can kind of see. So here, if I've um, illustrated how slow the successive approximations are. Okay, so I'm. I'm, I'm here plotting the iteration count, and then I'm plotting the the tolerance. Uh, that is the difference, the maximum absolute difference between two successive approximations. Okay, so that's that's going to be zero, right? Because you know you want to solve this model to to machine precision. Okay, um, and in first iteration, it's not quite there. Uh, next iteration, well, not much is happening actually. But after actually already two iterations, you see that the relative size of those two here is uh, close to beta. Another thing you see is not much has happened after 10,000 iterations. I mean, it's not nearly converged. But then you can switch to the Newton algorithm, um, and then in just in one step, it's just going to switch, sweep that uh, error away, and it's all converged in just one iteration. Okay. So the question is, when do you want to switch? Uh, and and you want to switch. Uh, you don't want to do ten thousand successive approximations for for, for sure. Um, uh, you want to switch before. And when is it optimal to switch in in and not do it in an ad hoc way? Okay. So so here's an illustration of uh, the uh, the iteration. Uh, uh, you know, the error bound is a function of the iteration count. And and I plotted here for different values of beta. So you have beta that's very close to one up here. And then you have a beta that is 0 0.95. So you know it on on this graph, it seems seems like we are converged pretty soon. Although we don't really know, you know, uh, I mean the error is, is is so small we can't see it on the graph. Um, and 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 here the error bound for for the example we're looking at is out here. It's uh it's it's not even 0 0.05 after 10,000 iterations. Okay. So so this seems to be very slow for beta. Uh, and if you take Actually, take the <coughs> the the log of the error bound and plot it against the iteration sound. You see, count. You see. You see now the linear convergence. I mean, this uh, uh, the log of the error bound is just uh, linear in the iteration count, and the slope is uh, uh, um, it depends on how beta close it is to, to beta is to one. So here the slope is 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 almost uh, zero, right? Because one minus beta is zero is zero point zero 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 one, uh, and and down here the slope is bigger. Okay. So iterations, um, it, you have linear convergence with successive approximations. But what happens if we do Newton iterations? Well, you here I've actually stopped after just two iterations. That's what Newton. That's what NFXP the, would say you should do in this case, and then it j jumps to Newton control of its iterations and say, okay, uh, two, four, seven, twelve. It's converged to machine precision. Okay, so this is here. You can see that like the exponent is almost doubling. Here it can't double, right? Because now we, we are operating at the edge of the precision, uh, precision of the machine. But um, it, 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 you, you really clearly see the quadratic convergence. You can also depict that here in a graph where you have the log error bound against the integration count. And so we did, did a few successive approximations until we uh, uh, started doing the. Um, uh, Newton Katorovich iteration that kicks in here at four, and then you can see uh, the the quadratic uh, the quadratic convergence here. It almost looked like a, par a parabola, right? So that's 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 pretty cool. Um, okay, so 
you know, if you're do, doing infinite horizon, fixed point problems, and beta is very close to one, there's just no way that you can, that I would have patience to wait for, for VFI. You need to do something else, and this would be successive approximations. Now for life cycle models, well, you just do the backward inductions, and that's, you know, for most people don't live, in my models, more than 70, uh, you know, 70 years, so, uh, or 100 years, so there's a finite number of iterations there. Um, but, but, but for infinite horizon models, you can't just wait for, for it to converge if beta is very close to one. Okay, so uh, one thing I want to start, uh, also mention here is when do you want to switch to Newton Kantorovich? Well, the first thing here is one of the things we observed um, in, in, in during these iterations was that the tolerance, um, um, the tolerance uh, defined as this, well, the click that slows down and declines uh, for beta close to one. Okay, so this is this is what we saw on this graph here, right? It's really like super flat when beta is close to one, um, and then the relative tolerance. Now the relative tolerance uh, approaches beta. So uh, here it actually happens after two iterations. Sometimes you need, need to take a few iterations before that's the case. Okay. Um, and what is that a sign of? I mean, the rel that the relative tolerance is equal to beta. Well, let's uh, oh, let's slide the slide. Okay. Now, the suppose first that the true that that your um, your initial starting point for your successive approximations would be equal to the true value, e v, plus just some constant. So now the expected value function is just shifted up uh, in levels for all levels of the state variables. Okay, so it's just a constant, doesn't depend on the states. Okay, so this is our initial guess now. So if we put that into uh, the Bellman operator and calculate the tolerance um, for an another successive approximation, well, that would be that starting point main minus the Bellman operator evaluated at the starting point. What is that? Well, <clears throat> since um, you, so what we do here is essentially just substituting in uh, our starting points, which is the true value plus its constant. Okay. Now, um, if you are at the true value plus a constant, right, then you can just put you take the this constant outside the Bellman operator, and then it's going to be multiplied by beta. Okay. But you can take it. You can take it outside. And and so uh, it's it's linear in that constant, okay, um, and and this means that the tolerance is going to be one minus beta times that uh, uh, cons uh, that that the constant, okay. So 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 um, we want the you know of course the constant to be zero so that the tolerance is zero and we have converged. So why don't we do another successive approximation? And well, you can you can kind of you know do the math right now. I'm starting the EV one, which is um, after another iteration where you have the beta, is, uh, our starting point is ZV plus beta K, which was what came out of our guess uh, of a successful approximation, you substitute that in here. And then you can, you know, do the math and then it, it goes to this, okay? Now, if you divide those two with each other, you get exactly beta. So the cool thing here is the one you discovered this could be that the relative tolerances that you can compute in two successive approximations, just like we've done here, like the relative tolerance here is effectively this guy divided by that guy, right? It's uh, uh, the current tolerance divided by the previous one. So that's that's something you can calculate. It turns out that's very close to beta. When that is close to beta, it's a sign that we captured mo most of the curvature and the rest is just going to be a constant. <clears throat> of course, you can iterate between the two algorithms as you want, and that's going to make it it's very fast and robust at the same time. <clears throat> So the bottom line is switch to Newton control of the situations whenever the relevant, to relevant relative tolerance is sufficiently close to beta. Okay, so step three. Now, another thing here is, uh, and I think maybe if you, you if you haven't discovered it while programming, you will. Okay, if you're working with logit models and and uh, with models with success with. Uh, um, with ID extreme value uh, errors in general, where you need to calculate log sums uh, and, and logit formulas, you will see a lot of exponentials. Okay, so now when we have beta going very close to to uh, to one, this means that you're effectively discounting 
you know, the future values a lot. Okay, so, you know, uh, you know so, sorry, you're putting a lot of weight on, on the future. Okay, so, I mean, with beta equal to 0 0.999, tomorrow is almost as good as today. So you calculate the uh, discounted stream of, of, uh, of values, it's going to be a bigger number when beta is close to 1. So this means that v is going to be very big. Okay, you take an exponential which of something that's very big, well, you're going to get infinity on a computer. Okay, so even though this is theoretically defined uh, and gives a choice probability that could be low, say for instance with the re replacement prob probability that would be pretty low, but but you know bounded, it's definitely bounded away from zero. You're going to have infinity divided by the sum of infinities. Okay, and the computer just can't handle that. See, the trick here is to identify what is the maximum value. Okay, that just calculates the max of overall the alternatives for each of the states. Okay, and then you can just subtract that in the logic form. This gives exactly the same thing. You can subtract the constant in this denominator and, and numerator, and and now um, since this is the max, what you can have here is, is at most zero. Okay, so you can never have overflow on the computer, meaning that this can go to plus infinity. Okay, and that the computer would have to like truncate the numbers in order to represent the number on the computer. Okay, so you like lose a lot of precision. But but here that's not a problem. You're not going to have un uh, overflow. You can potentially have underflow. That is now it's a big negative number. Okay, this means you take an exponential of something which is you know uh, going to be close to minus infinity. But that's that's much less of a problem, right? Because in this case, the exponential of a very small number is going to be exactly zero. Okay, so you want it to be exactly zero in that case. Okay. So I mean, this is the bottom line. Here is that this is subtracting the max within the log, the the logic formula makes this logic formula much more stable. The same thing goes for for the log sum formula, where you can take out the max and write it the, the Bowman equation in exactly this way. Okay, so so this uh, this is fairly important because otherwise you're going to have a lot of numerical instability. Okay, now we already talked a little bit about the, the derivatives of the Bellman operator. Well, we need that for the uh, newton cantor iteration, and, and, and you can say that MPAC needs it for uh, building up the Jacobian and the constraints when solving the, the constraint optimization problem. Um, so here it's really, uh, you know, in terms of its finite uh, dimensional approximation with n, n uh, number of grid points, uh, the, this Frechet derivative takes the form of an n by n matrix with partial derivatives uh, uh, that we already talked about. This is what is equal to uh, um, uh, choice probability weighted sum of trans transition matrices times beta. Um, so this is, you know, this is really just two lines of code in MATLAB. So here I've done it for for the Bellman up, uh, the Bellman, uh, the implementation of the Bellman operator uh, in, in 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 MATLAB um, for in in expected value function space. Okay, so so here I'm doing the recentering. Okay, so we have, say we, first we calculate the maximum value, and then you <clears throat> uh, subtract that when you calculate the, 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 this log sum. And in order to calculate the expected value, well then you multiply with the uh, transition matrix. Okay, and then there's a little bit of a trick here because in this particular example where you have that the uh, expected value function, which is you know in principle is is, a, is indexed both by the state but also by by the decision, only have one column here because uh, the first element um, in in the expected value function is just equal to um, the value of replacing the engine because you get a brand new engine, so you get back to the same element. Okay. Uh, choice probabilities. Well, uh, here I've just re rewritten it, but, but just to make sure that that I'm 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 writing the I'm writing the choice probabilities in a way where uh, I'm never going to mul uh, multiply with plus infinity. Okay, so you know I can pr in principle have have underflow here in the value of replacing. Well, that's um, um, that's going to be an increasing difference of the replacement cost. So you're going to get a nice numerical probability if you do it in this way, or if you do it like I, I wrote on the on the slide here, which is kind of more in the spirit of you know taking the max and subtracting it. Um, so, <clears throat> um, and the Bellman uh, uh, the, to compute the Frechet derivative. Well, again, you have beta, and then you have uh, the transition matrix. Uh, uh, associated with keeping the engine times the um, uh, times the uh, 
uh, probability of keeping, okay? And, and this is like an element by element, uh, um, uh, which is going on element by element multiplication here. And then you need to add an additional term for, uh, for the derivative with respect to EV1, since it appears in the, in the log sums for all the states, okay? This is what's going on in the second line. It's actually simpler when you look at it, implement, the Bowman operator implemented in, um, in, 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 uh, in terms of the smooth value functions or, or integrated value functions that we talked about last time too. Um, you can represent the, the Bowman equation here in, in, uh, in smooth value function space, essentially just you know, calculated um, uh, as a mapping from, from uh, the log sums <laughs> to the log sums, if you will, of the smooth value functions here. Um, um, to f from smooth value functions to smooth value functions. Okay, so then the the multiplication with the transition matrix is going on inside here. Okay, now if you take the derivatives of this guy here, it's very very easy to implement the derivatives. You see this choice probability weighted sum of derivatives, which is essentially just like uh, you know probability uh, of of keeping engine times the probability uh, times the transition matrix conditional on keeping um, um, plus the uh, the transition matrix uh, conditional on replacement times one minus probability keeping with probability of replacing and then all multiplied by beta. So so very 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 simple to to uh, to implement in this case here. So you know literally it's just one line of code. Okay, so it's not hard, much harder to do the uh, fresh sheet derivative and Newton control iterations to 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 do that. Now providing analytical gradients of the likelihood is is very much in, in the same spirit of of the uh, the Bellman equation, but now see the key difference here is that with the Bellman, uh, sorry, sorry, it's the same spirit, spirit as you do MPEG uh, to solve the uh, um, to solve the, uh, the 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 structural estimation problem. Uh, there you would have to calculate the the gradients of the likelihood function with respect to the structural parameters, and you get something like this. Okay, now the difference was that we would in MPEG only have to calculate the utility difference, but now since we're differentiating the expected, we are differentiating parameters, um, uh, uh, differentiating likelihood with respect to parameters, need to take account for the fact that the expected value function is also changing because it's an implicit function of the parameters. So, uh, and this is why this is the derivative of this value function difference. I, in order to calculate the value function difference, well, then well, uh, I'm not showing everything here, but in order to do do this, the, 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 the derivatives of the choice specific values, well, you need to calculate the derivatives of the expected value, not only the, the Bellman operator, but the expected value, the fixed point, right? And here you need to use the, the implicit function theorem. Uh, and by the implicit function theorem, we get that the, um, that the uh, derivative of the fixed point is essentially one minus the uh, Frechet derivative inverse times partial derivatives of the Bellman operator with respect to the structural parameters. And now you're back to actually just using some of those same components that you would calculate um, um, as um, uh, some of the same components you will calculate when you're doing MPEG. So that this is corresponding, this part is corresponding to the last uh, elements uh, of this matrix here. Let me just find it um, uh, here, right? You know, this is like the Frechet derivative of the Bellman operator. I mean, you're here we're differentiating the Bellman operator with respect to uh, the expected value. So this is like the Frechet derivative, okay? And what is this? Well, this is a Bellman operator differentiated with respect to the parameters, okay? Oh, no, 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 no. This is, we need the likelihood function. Um, where is that? Here we got those bagged out, right? So this is like the partial uh, derivatives uh, with respect to the likelihood function. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping a bunch of slides for them back. Uh, I want to find where we were. Um, okay. So yeah, this is where we were. Okay, so now you can compute this and it's essentially just a little bit of matrix algebra. And, and these derivatives, well, we can, the derivatives of the Bellman operator with respect to the uh, parameters, so that was corresponding to the first um, a uh, couple of the first elements in the Jacobian of the constraints. So essentially you need the same, calculate the same elements to do the MPEG in some sense, okay? And then see here, this is a byproduct of the newton kontorovich iteration, uh, newton kontorovich algorithm, okay? You calculate that inverse already, okay? Okay, so um, 
in order to calculate those scores, well, you're going to have uh, uh, different scores for different parameters, and I'm not going to spend so much time on it. But see here, the first, uh, the, uh, the, the first uh, element uh, or the first column on the score of the scores is going to be the derivatives with respect to the replacement uh, cost parameters, the partial derivatives. Uh, and, and they're very much similar to what we had before. Um, and then you calculate uh, the derivatives of the belt of the fixed point with respect to the um, with respect to par par parameters essentially, right? Which is the Frechier derivative or the, uh, the identity operator minus the Frechier derivative uh, f, as you have seen on the slide. Uh, inverse times times the derivatives, the partial derivatives of the Bellman operator with respect to the parameters. Okay, and so th so this is this is what's going on here. I'm calculating the derivatives of the fixed point. Okay, and then I'm just com computing the log of the likelihoods by by putting putting all that together with the uh, derivatives of uh, of the individual parameters. In this case, we're differentiating with respect to R C, uh, and then with respect to the the cost parameters. So this is a derivative of the cost parameter. And so on. Okay, so so this is uh you know how you do that. Okay, now let, last thing I want to talk about here is the B triple H algorithm. Okay, now we have calculated derivatives. Um, we have calculated the, the derivatives of like the function at all the uh, oxidations um, with respect to all the parameters. Now doing that, um, and the doing the derivative of the <clears throat> the second order derivatives of the likelihood function is going to be pretty nasty, right? So now, uh, it, doing those differentiations, uh, you know, second time, we want to avoid that. It also takes time. So uh, a very neat algorithm for maximum likelihood is, is relying on the information identity here, which is saying that the, the negative uh, 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 of the expectation of the Hessian is equal to the expectation of the outer product of the scores. And, and so when you're doing your Newton Rapson, which is essentially, you know, the theta, the parameter guess where you are now, times some step size, times the, 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 the Hessian inverse, times the gradient, which is the uh, sum of the scores. Uh, once you take, uh, you want to avoid calculating that. But if you can approximate this by the outer product of the gradients, you don't, you, that you have from down here. So essentially just substituting in, in that, then you get the B triple H algorithm, which is using the outer product of the score as the an approximation of the Hessian. And this is this is an again a place where you're using uh, structure and the problem implied by theory, in this case econometric theory for maximum likelihood, to simplify the problem to reduce the computational complexity. So now we don't have to calculate second second order derivatives. Now this is of course only valid for maximum likelihood and and, and, and conditional maximum likelihood, uh, and and but but uh, but because that's where the identity information identity hold. It's also only an asymptotic result, so it holds an expectation that what well, holds is n go to infinity number of observations, go to infinity not number of grid points, but number of uh, observations go to infinity and at the true parameters. Okay, so so it only holds at the true parameters. But in reality, this is actually pretty good. I mean, also for uh, for other types of esti m estimators, it's not necessary. I mean, it's, as long as it's some some sample sum of the objective function you're using in in, in estimation, it's it's usually a pretty good approximation. Actually, now now let's look at what it's doing. I mean, some of the benefits here is that uh, the benefit some of the benefits of B triple H is that the outer part of the gradient, because it's essentially you know, or the outer part of the score is essentially the score squared, okay? Or it's actually the variance of the scores. So the variance of the scores can never be negative, right? So this means that we are always multiplying uh, here with with uh, something that is, uh, you know, now we're putting in the negative of it, so it's eating that minus, but but it it's um it's it's always it's always uh, positive here, right? This is positive, okay? So it always has this, the right sign in some sense. So in here, in a convex region, if you're maximizing the likelihood, right? I mean, you have to be a little careful because usually we're using minimization algorithms. You have to replace convex by concave and, and you know, turn the graph upside down. But I think you can live with that, okay? So, in, but in a convex region here, well, Newton, the pure version of newton raption is going to take you in the opposite direction of the gradient. So, um, uh, and that's that's a real that's a known problem, right? Because what what is what is the you know in in this area here 
Well, here the slope is increasing, meaning that the um, um, meaning that the, that the derivatives are increasing, meaning that the second order derivatives are positive. Okay, so now we look at Newton Rapson and says, okay, positive time positive, this is where I'm going. So, oh man, there's a minus there. So uh, essentially it moves downhill. It moves in the opposite direction of the gradient. Okay, so if it's, if it's, it's essentially, if it's up with sloping, <laughs> it's going in the opposite direction. This is exactly the opposite of what we want to do. Okay, so this is, in Newton's methods, is really uh, good, but in convex regions of a maximization problem, you're gonna be in trouble. And you can't solve this by line search, right? Because line search, that would essentially, you know, say you're having, having, having the step. Well, then you're gonna say, Newton wraps and say you go over here, you have the step, you're still in a convex region, you just can't get out of it, you get stuck. Whereas if you're in, the, in in B triple H, well, that's still good, right? Because in uh, the because the outer product of the gradient is always positive definite. Okay, so you put that right in here. So you have your your basically your negative of your Hessian is going to be positive. So you're going to move always in the uh, in the direction um, in the direction of the gradient. So uh, it moves uphill, which is um, exactly what we want to have. Okay, so B triple H, it's working here, it's working here, and it's faster to compute. So, so many, here's some advantages. It's always positive, definite, moves always up a hill for even for small values of the step size. It does not rely on second order derivatives. It's, it, it has a disadvantage that's only a good approximation of the true parameters and, and, and asymptotically and for well-specified models at the true parameters. But reality is for most maximum likelihood models where, where you're you know, in the domain of, in the, in, in the area where the parameters are, it's a really, really powerful algorithm. So this is, uh, this is really what I, uh, you know, uh, uh, recommend for applied work, okay? Now for well, uh, another thing is it's only similar uh, superlinear convergence, uh, uh, not quadratic. But I would say these problems are definitely, you know, second order uh, in uh, when you when the alternative is that you move away from the maximum. Okay. So, um, but you can always use like B triple H for the first iterations, and then uh, switch to BFGS or even you know Newton with a with a full Hessian update uh, as you get to closer to the maximum. You want to like fine tune your algorithm. Okay, so here's here's a quote from a previous president of the United States. Uh, you know, it's been it's been a long journey, and it's a uh, um, and, and, and this, so I think this applies for structural estimation too. So I'm just going to read it here. Um, the road ahead will be long, our climb will be steep. We may not get there in one year or even in one term, but America, I've never been more hopeful than I am today that we will get there. I promise you, as a people, we will get there. And you know, it, it's up there. We're gonna maximize the likelihood function and you're gonna go with, with me with all these six steps. And I think if you do that and code it up, you're gonna get there eventually. Okay, we just have to be patient and uh, you know, work with the code and kill all the bugs. Okay, and also the sitting president is, you know, he's he's saying this is the best business advice I ever had is, you know, use B triple H. So, um, so, so there's a, there's very good, um, you know, you have you have to think about implementation, and there's going to be a whole exercise on on notebooks and how to, how to implement all the details of what I just went through in 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 the next Tuesday. So here's you know convergence achieved, we get some results. Okay. So now I want to return to the table uh, we, we, we'll, we, we looked at in the beginning from the Sue and Jet paper um, that showed that uh, NFXP was really like a dinosaur method. So like two, it took 748,000 successive approximations to estimate the model with beta equal to 0 0.999. And if you implement all this, you're not going to take so many successive approximations. So here we basically replicated the same table for the three types of implementation methods. For comparison, we also did MPEC and, and, uh, and MPEC and MATLAB and MPEC and Ample. The results are virtually the same as in the Sue and Judd paper. It's much faster once you use second order derivatives, and and we actually you know get it faster because I get maybe we have a faster computer uh, than they had. Um, so zero point zero five seconds for you know irrespectively of the specification. But see, it's not converging all the time. I mean, sometimes I'm mean, here. It's starting impact ample is actually starting for five different starting values. Um, uh, to to to. Uh, to you know, try to see if you know can find a better solution, um, and yet it's not always the case that it's converging. 
um, whereas n of xp is incredibly robust, okay? And uh, the reason is the following, okay? I mean, it was not robust in their implementation because they didn't have the success of approximation, recentering, and Bellman equations, and uh, logit formulas, and B triple H algorithm, and so on. But here it is. And the reason is it's using, making use of an algorithm that is globally convergent, the success of approximations, okay? You, 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 you know because of the contraction map, you always get into this domain of attraction. And then once you get into that domain of attraction, when the relative tolerance is equal to, you know, beta, is equal to beta, you switch to newton Kantorovich. If it doesn't work out, you're not going to accept necessarily accept that Newton step. You can just go back and do success approximations. So the inner fixed point algorithm is just, you know, it's proven that it will converge eventually. Okay, okay, but it is really fast and it is robust. So it's both fast and robust. Okay, and and for the uh, for the maximization of the likelihood function, well, we're using the B triple H algorithm, so you're not getting into to uh, any convex areas of the uh, likelihood function. Not going to be a problem for this model here, the Lochit model, uh, because it has a globally concave likelihood function once the linear utility function is. Is is if the utility function is linear, which is not actually the case here, but but you know it's kind of concavicating, so to say, the the uh, the likelihood function. So um, yeah. Anyway, so you know if you look at the results, they're pretty much you know similar to what you obtain by ample. I mean, and 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 now we've been through it. We can also see that ample and NFXP is not really. You know, it's relying on the same structure as the, the same Frechita, the Frechita derivative and the derivatives of the Bellman operator with respect to the parameters. These are the, the, the Jacobians of the constraints and the impact problem. Okay, so we're using same, many of the same pr uh, principles. Okay, now see the number of Bellman iterations. Well, that's that's much 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 lower, and number of uh, uh, of uh, uh, Newton Kantorovich iterations is 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 also fairly low. I mean, this is for the entire through the entire estimation uh, routine. So it's not this number is not seven hundred forty eight thousand. Okay, so we use a little bit more successful approximations than a few uh, uh, Newton Kantorovich iterations. Okay. So um, so that's that's really good and and the um, and the number of you know, major iterations is actually fewer right because we have fewer parameters to maximize the function with respect to and the sec we're using second order derivatives to maximize that function because we're using the outer product of the gradient approximation to that Hessian so we get actually fewer iterations that you do when you do. Uh, even MPEG ample with second order derivatives because that's more parameters there. And then uh, comparing to MPEG uh, with, uh, uh, without those second order derivatives, well, then you need to do a lot of numerical uh, de de derivatives. Uh, the machine have to do that. So that takes obviously much more time. And as you have more parameters, you're going to take even more time. Okay, now we do this for a sample size of 6,000, which corresponds to what Tu and Jot had in their paper. But if you increase it to, to 60,000, actually uh, NFXP is now much faster. As actually, the computer time is virtually almost independent. Uh, no, it's not independent, but it's increasing slowly in the in number of observations, where it's, it's much higher now for, for NFXP. You can see it here, right? So it was 0 0.05, and now it's 10 times as much with 10 times as many observations. Uh, and, and the reason here is when you're calculating all those second uh, order derivatives of the of the of the likelihood uh, function with respect to so many different parameters. I mean, we in the for NFXP you only have two parameters if you have two structural parameters. But here up here you have 175 plus two parameters. Okay, so so this is just a much bigger matrix that rely that that is where the computational time depends on computing the. Uh, uh, a sum of all the observations. So when you increase that and differentiate something that's in increasing the number of observations, well, then your computer time is going to increase much more when you uh, have so many elements as you have in the matrix. I mean, let's go back just to visualize a little bit here, where we have it. Here's a Hessian, right? All these elements here, they are uh, based on second order derivatives of sums of all the observations. So uh, since there are many more of them than there are in in NFXP, where you would only have like a two, a two by two matrix up here, uh, the small matrix up here, for impact, you have all this stuff here, even utilizing all this sparsity. So let's go take a final look at what is going on as you um, then uh, increase the number of observations uh, linearly. And you can see here we got the, the uh, computer time per major iteration. So the time it takes to take an iteration in order to, to, to maximize. 
that when searching over the parameter space is increasing in the sample size. That's not so surprising because you have to evaluate the objective function over this, in this increasing sized sample. But look at the slope here. The slope is just much, much flatter for, um, for, for MPEG. Oh, for, for NFXP, for NFXP, the neutral conservative range. Whereas it's much, much steeper. It's simply just because the, the size of the Hessian is just much, much bigger. Okay, so you can also see, okay, this total CPU time it just increases uh, a lot when you do it for larger samples. Okay, so here's a uh, conclusion. So Su and Judd, well, they, you know, I think they, uh, without, um, um, uh, inadvertently um, used an inefficient version of NFXP when they made the comparison in the graph uh, I showed to begin with. So that, that solely relied on the uh, method of success, success approximation to solve the fixed point problem. Then using this inefficient, using an efficient version of NFXP, we find that in, in, in our comment to that paper that N, uh, M, MPEG and NFXP are similar performance with the sample size is relatively small, like, you know, this example they show with uh, with with six thousand buses, but then it slows, uh, and and NFXP does not slow down as beta goes to to one. In fact, Newton doesn't care what beta is, and 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 uh, and um, it's only the success of approximation. So once you you use a combination, it's going to be independent of beta. Uh, some of the desirable features of of, of MPEG I want to highlight because this is not an MPEG, uh, I'm not trying to bash MPEG in any way here. It is that it's actually quite easy to implement if you're using this high level programming software like Ample. We're not covering that in the course, but it's actually uh, uh, it's actually fairly simple because you know in the end you if you're using high level software constraint supplementation problem. The only thing you need to uh, really impose is what is the constraints and what is the objective function. Then the machinery is taking care of the rest and doing that success, uh, doing uh, the doing <coughs> doing uh, the, the, the constraint optimization problem and there's like professional people who have coded all that stuff and in a very efficient way. So that's very easy to use. But I would say I found it harder to use on specialized problems where I want to fine tune my model to to special cases or, or, or and for bigger models. It's 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 I have found the software you know, cumbersome to use and and also in many cases impossible to implement the model I had in mind. So I would say a desirable feature is that you know it can easily implement simple models in Ample uh, even of larger sizes. Even though there's also a curse of dimensionality in involved in solving constraint optimization problems. And here the number of variables is in increasing quite fast <laughs> as you have more and more state variables. Another thing to highlight here is NFXP gives you, uh, for, for inference, uh, is that NFXP gives you the real um, um, second-order derivatives uh, of the likelihood function, not on the likelihood function without imposing the constraints. Uh, even at the optimum, when you calculate the derivatives, you need to take into account the derivatives of the likelihood function um, um, is uh, you take into account that the expected value or the, the value function, whatever is inside, is an implicit function of parameters. And that differentiation is already taken care of and it's really a, a byproduct of the NFXP algorithm, as we already talked about. So, uh, because you're calculating those second order derivatives in order to maximize the likelihood function. And these are the ones that you use for your, your calculating uh, variance covariance matrix of the estimator. It's, it's, what is it? It's like the inverse of, the, uh, uh, of this approximation of the Hessian divided by the number of observations. Or, and then you take the square root and, and, and then you got your standard errors, everything is fine. Whereas for MPEG, standard errors can be computed, numer can, can be computed using the boarded Hessian. And there's a paper by, by Reich and Judd that, that divides how to do it, but it's, uh, um, and, and there's, a, there's also a simple uh, approach to uh, efficient approach to compute uh, confidence intervals, but you would not you would not be able to use the standard formulas. You would have to use uh, look up in in uh, in in Gregor Reich's paper with with Kinjot, which is uh, quite recent. I have I have the paper if you want. I'm not sure it's actually uh, online. Um, so um, MPEG finally does not seem appropriate when estimating life cycle models. Well, first of all, you have to do the backward induction anyway, and uh, and if you were to in, in, estimate it for a life cycle or finite horizon models, then the number of constraints or number of variables there will be an expected value function for each time period. So if you had to solve a circuits problem, 
for uh, t time periods, it would be t times n number of variables. So, uh, so say circle to live for a hundred years and have a hundred grip points, then it's ten thousand combinations. Okay, so you need ten hundred times more variables than you have for the finite horizon problem. And you can see where this is going. So it's like adding another state variable uh, with many values, and, and and so it's not really meant for that either. Anyway, that's 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 it for now. Um, uh, yeah, see you on lecture 14. Next time we're going to talk about some empirical applications of